we'll uh, go ahead and get started uh, amazingly on time this time around. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, welcome to the monthly A2 New Tech uh, Meetup. My name is Brian Kelly. I have been hosting this for all of two months. This is the second one. So um, thanks for coming back from the second one last time. Um, how, how many people are first time A2 New Tech tonight? Show of hands. Cool. So maybe 25-ish percent. Um, well, so the story of this is um, it's been going on for probably five plus years, and uh, it's a forum for Ann Arbor folks in, interested in tech and entrepreneurship to get together every month. Um, the, the the part I always say is like you know everybody's busy, everyone has it's hard to find time in your day, but uh, increasingly as this community grows, we have over four thousand people on the mailing list. Um, it's nice to have a third Tuesday of every month that we can all get together and uh, support each other both through hearing the, the pitches that your peers here will be given tonight um, and connecting with one another. Um, so thanks for coming out. Um, we'll, we'll make some time uh, later in the event to do community announcements. So if you have jobs you're plugging or other meetups you want to present or you know, tell people about, we'll have some time for that after the pitches. Um, as you probably know, it's five companies. Uh, they'll each do a five minute pitch of their product and company followed by five minutes of audience Q&A. When you're asking a question, uh, if you are soft-spoken or if you need some amplification, just press this, uh, press and hold the button on the, uh, the table to ask your question. That'll help pick it up on the intercom. Um, oh, and so uh, each of these companies you know, are, are, are anywhere from early validation through growth stage. We've had companies come back after they have raised money, talk about exits or talk about additional rounds. So um, the, the, the profile is pretty broad in who we want to pitch. And if you have any, any company that you want to pitch or you know anyone, email organizers at a2newtech.org. We'll be in the same location through November and December, so you know how to get here next month. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we'll meet up at Pizza House afterward. I'll remind everybody of that. Um, and a big thank you to a couple of groups that helped make this possible. Uh, one, the Entrepreneurship Clinic uh, at U of M Law School um, provides us with this space. It's really nice that it's been through, gosh, probably the last 18 months or so that we've been here. Um, so a big thanks to Bryce and everyone involved there. Um, A2 Geeks is a nonprofit uh, in Ann Arbor that runs events uh, such as A2 New Tech, uh, Coffee House Coders. What are some other ones, Zach? Yeah, Ignite Ann Arbor. Just it, Ignite Ann Arbor, yeah. Um, and uh, Zach, by the way, was the MC here for a long, long, long time before, before I joined. So, any questions or uh, anything, hit, hit him up. And uh, finally, Roger uh, Rail from R2 Vive for doing the recording and live streaming. Uh, thanks as always, Roger. It's great to have these uh, videos captured um, so all the pre presenters can send them off to their parents. <laughs> uh, and so with that, uh, mute your phones. If you're gonna tweet, use hashtag A2NewTech. And first up, we got Steve Colson from Alertly. send notifications about important events to yourself, to business users, or to your systems. Let's take a quick look at some scenarios. Let a tech know when a jet engine is performing suboptimally. This seems like a good idea. Get the parts where they need to be so that we can fix it when the plane lands. We can keep a small anomaly from becoming a big or expensive problem. Or this one, an operations team needs to know so that they can fix the issue or add new servers, or however they need to react. Scaling or server issues are time sensitive, and lots of ops teams already have graphs or reports, but you have to always be looking at them in order to catch an issue. How are you supposed to get anything else done if you're always watching a chart? Let my sales manager know 
when anyone is within 15% of their goals so that they can congratulate or they can assist. The sales manager is looking for outliers in their report. Why spend over an hour a day reading through reports when your system should just tell you when important things have happened? Let my purchasing manager know when we're low on umbrellas and it's going to rain so that they can order more. This one should be a no-brainer, but it just isn't possible with most software. Or <coughs> even better, just tell my system to automatically issue a pre-order PO to our preferred umbrella vendor. So when monitoring data sets and streams, here's the thing. One answer is reports. But what a waste of time for so many people. You have to log in somewhere and actively look at a report regardless of if there are underlying problems to be found. And frankly, there are a lot of scenarios where reports are inefficient or just don't apply. Like when you need to react more quickly than a once daily or even weekly report batch. So what else do we have? Well, another option is you could code it yourself, but we all know how that goes. On top of all of this, the end result is probably pretty inflexible, and let's be real, you have better things to worry about. And what happens when your boss comes along with the latest change? We certainly would like to know about oxygen problems on our airplanes. At least I would. Every time you want to add a new search pattern, it takes more code and more complexity that probably wasn't planned for to begin with. You could just write code for a user interface for your boss, and they could add their own alerts. But that's even more time and even more complexity. Enter alert link. Why waste weeks or months of your precious time? We've already built this engine. Connecting with Alertly is a breeze. It's a lot quicker and easier, and you could have been done in under an hour. We find simple issues and complex outliers, and then we notify you when something important is afoot. We have a first-class user interface and a set of APIs that's complete. Here's how it works. Our APIs and user interface allows you to quickly and easily find your lists and data. You or your business users create simple or complex matching rules on those lists and assign relevant schedules. You upload your data and you choose how to be notified when important thresholds have been met. We are looking for organizations that need this kind of functionality, have or will have data, and need to react to important events, who would potentially be willing to be a beta customer. Thank you so much for your time. About Ten seconds to spare. I'm impressed. All right, we'll take another five minutes now for questions for Steve. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, so who's your, who do you think is the primary buyer for this product, buyer and user? Well, we are early beta stage, so we're, we're trying to figure this out a little bit. But at the moment, we're primarily uh, marketing to the technical audience, folks who have to implement some kind of alerting mechanism uh, you know, for a CIO, for their boss, for whomever. And rather than reinventing the wheel every single time, uh, they could just tie into this kind of library and, uh, you know, give their boss a nice UI to work with. Got it. So, oh, I'll go around and start some questions down here. Um, do you have to just, like, upload a single file, or can you connect it to a database that sort of automatically <coughs> the JSON, or is it just, like, uploaded itself? Yeah, so we have a RESTful API right now, and that's the uh, main mechanism for uh, data ingress. Uh, so you could either batch, uh, upload, or more or less stream, depending on your needs. So, question? Tell me about your team. Uh, we are a small team at the moment. It's a, a 
Ben Top, gentleman over there, and myself, it's sort of this, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and the, the garage thing at home. Uh, but we do have a plan to scale, you know, as we grow. So. Do you have documentation, and can we see it? Uh, there, on launch of beta customers, is documentation, and absolutely it will be public. I had thought that critical equipment vendors automatically in their software have alerts for critical things, like I'm thinking of medical equipment. Mm -hmm. um, do you really know that there is a need for um, equipment alerts? I mean, use that as one of your examples. I'm just wondering whether you've done any research on that. Sure. Uh, so there are a number of systems that do have alerting built into them, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, you know, in the medical industry, that's kind of a big deal for low latency alerts. Um, there are a number of systems that don't, especially in the business, uh, or there's a number of systems that can't marry multiple data sets very well. Uh, so the notion of, you know, it's about to rain and I'm almost out of umbrellas. Uh, a lot of ERPs don't really have the ability to pull in outside data outside of what's in that ERP. So uh, we have run into a number of businesses uh, that have full-blown data warehouses that still have a need for something like this because their stack just doesn't accommodate. Yes, sir? AIP? Uh, well, we wrote all the code, so sure. <laughs> no, that's not the answer. <laughs> We're here the end. Do you know of any, of any uh, competitors? Uh, do we know of any competitors? So. Not in a specific sense. We're sort of in this weird middle ground where we're not trying to be a business intelligence platform. We're not trying to deliver reports. We're trying to supplement. Uh, at the low end, we're not trying to be something like if this, then that, because that's just this really trivial uh, enter a jailed area, something happens, nothing else. So as far as we could find, there isn't a lot of good solutions for uh, you know, most of this, you know, the, the marriage of these two things. Yes, In what ways does the system actually alert you? you email you? Like, yeah, so email, text message, if we need to do a webhook to your system or some other ping to your system. Uh, we're currently, uh, you know, adding pager duty integration for the folks that already have that and would rather have their own escalation policies. Um, that's one of the things in this early beta phase, if a lot of our customers say we need X, it's a great opportunity to add that. Yes, sir? How is it for like a complex alert, is it easier in your system than to code it yourself? For something complex, right, code is kind of an optimal way to do something complex. So if you have to do something complex, how is your system easier than just code? Yeah, so uh, if you're only going to do one alert ever, and you're not tying in with outside systems, but you're still going to own that addition. Uh, the, the real issue is when you start doing multiple conditions, because what system is really only looking at one condition ever? I have one more question. Is we price the platform? That's a great question. So in this beta phase, we're trying to price with our uh, prospective betas relevant to what they're actually consuming. Uh, as soon as we launch, uh, it'll be closer to the SaaS model of something like PagerDuty or something like that. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next up we get Matt Visk from Retail Spot. Come on down and get your computer hooked up. For anyone that arrived late, we're in a second of five pitches right now, and uh, we'll do some community announcements towards the end, um, probably after the last presentation goes. Similar service 
for e-commerce that helps people create um, e-commerce websites easily stress-free. So here's the portfolio site, here's the retail spot. <clears throat> As you can see, it has a cool user interface. I'm sorry, this is my this is my partner, Jules. He's an engineer with Quicken. I'm a developer at GM. Um, anyway, Hello. here's the <laughs> retail <laughs> spot. Um, it, it provides a super easy way to get your e-commerce website up and running within minutes, or even seconds. You're not required to populate any, any credentials that you, know, you might not want to put in, like your social security or anything like that. You can start selling right away in order to make transactions come into your bank account. Um, you may need some credentials depending on which country you're in later, but as long as the customers are up and running within seconds, I think they'll be satisfied and happy with providing credentials later on. Um, I can log in, I can sign up and or, log, or sign up and show you the application a bit. creating a store for Jules. He is an expert at coffee beans. He loves to sell coffee beans. Um, <laughs> just as an example, uh, he would arrive here at the products page. Once it loads, it's ready to add a category and then you're well on your way to finishing your store. So with the first category created, you can either add a product or you can add a subscription. Subscriptions are awesome. They have reoccurring charges that just keep coming in in your sleep and, and they just keep going until the member cancels their subscription. So I think it's a great way to make money uh, repeatedly with selling one product. So we added subscriptions recently as well as product. And if I were to add a product, all I would do Right away, I would add the photo, get that loading, and then while I'm doing that, I can um, start entering the product information. It's pretty much as, as easy as it gets for, for doing repetitive tasks for owners, like putting in products. Well, now I have to find a picture of a coffee bean. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> We also sell bikinis. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing great about Retail Spot is, is it, um, it handles your inventory for you. If you wanted to have add a shirt or something along that line that could have different sizes or or um, different colors. It's easy to add those different variations and add a, a, a quantity associated with each variation. So it takes a lot of the, the tedious work out for people. Um, another thing I could show you is banners. If, if, we, if we go to many store websites, you'll find banners, big banners that that pretty much blast in the face of which product they want to sell you and which one is they think will sell. So banners are a big part of your store and, and with Retail Spot you can get them in and they will look great right away. Um, here's an example store for you with coffee related items. Um, there's a banner at the top and if you click over you'll see that it's just a few different Title, uh, subtitle, and, and, and CTA or call to action. And then below you'll have your products listed. Some are subscriptions and some are just regular products. You can add them to your cart. Here. And once you have a bunch of different things in your cart, you can easily check out. Um, this won't work. This is a test. This is a test account. The site's now live, so we can we can uh, start accepting any members who want to sell anything, really, so um, you'll, you'll see more of it as you go. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, questions? Hold the mind back. I'll let some other folks ask.
Who's up first? Uh, just out of curiosity, I have a similar e-commerce platform. Do you guys have any kind of integrations uh, that, like, type to uh, HipChat or Slack or anything? Uh, not as of yet. I mean, with Portfolio Lounge, we kept things simple, and, I mean, we've been growing ever since. So we're going to try to keep it simple to start out, and then, I mean, they have features later on, but um, right now it's just pretty basic. Yeah? Do you guys have, like, a Google search option? So instead of searching through a store, you, sorry, I'll try to speak up. Um, a global search option. So instead of searching by store, like browsing one person's little portal that you have on the website, can you search for a type of product, and then it gives you a list of different stores that you can go to and sell products like that? Well, currently we have zero members. We, we just launched. Mm -hmm. Probably right now we could say that. <laughs> <laughs> As for that, that, that has been a thought in my mind. Once we get a ton of products, we'll be able to use the data that we collect to display them in, in uh, you know, popular order or, or something like that. Kind of have an aggregated collection of retail spot products, and I think that'll be great once that starts kicking in too. So. How, do, how do you guys, uh, like, the, the, the site that comes to mind for me is Squarespace. How do you compare to that for what you're trying to do here? Squarespace is pretty new, I think. It's, it's an industry that, that a lot of up-and-coming companies are coming into, but um, e-commerce is getting bigger and bigger by the, the day. It's, it's expected to grow another 30% in the next year, or 25 to 30%. Um, says some article I read. So, yeah, but uh, I mean, so the market is big enough that you think you've got there's there is some competition, you. and I, I did make sure to go through their sites and, and take note as to, as to uh, how easy it is to use and, and whether or not I would like to use it. And I, I definitely think creating a simple store builder. Um, Squarespace, our app is simple, more simple than Squarespace. That was our goal. We want we don't care about a fancy website. We just want to sell our product. Yeah, got it. So speaking directly to the e-commerce buyer. So, so would that be equally true then for Shopify, in your opinion? Because I mean, I use Shopify. I've tried Shopify, Shopify, and I'm ashamed, I, or I'm, I don't know how they, they got to where they are. I mean, there's, there's definitely room for improvement with their product as well. It's, it's, it's like I said, it's a new market, so the up and comings are just anyone who's done it, I think. But um, I think, uh, oh, go on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, if I'm a shop owner, how do I pay for this? Right now, it, it doesn't cost any money. It, it costs 2.9% um, interest per transaction, plus 30 cents um, per transaction. Most companies, they'll do a monthly subscription or something like that. Right now, since we just launched, we're going to keep it free, uh, make sure everything's top-notch before we start making people pay up front. Does um, a merchant do I get to like have any say in what uh, payment gateway I can use? Or? Well, we have the payment gateway hooked up and integrated with the site already, so no. <laughs> uh, I, I was noticing as you were in your demo, um, let's see, and, and this is just uh, I remember a little bit of e-commerce personally. Um, working with uh, inventory and, and multiple different variations of inventory, so if you wanted a red shirt versus a, a white shirt and different sizes and stuff like that, is that a common for Yeah, it is. Um, it's actually super easy to do as well. I mean, before people would have to add, let's say they have three colors and three shirts. That's, you know, um, nine different variations <laughs> right off the bat or something like that. Anyway. Now that's programmed, so you add the colors, you add the sizes, it puts out every variation, you add the quantities if you're keeping track, and you know, it's, it's real simple, simple as, it, as that process could be, I think. What kind of tracking have you had on the other side of the portfolio? Portfolio Lounge has 16,000 members so far, and there's, a upgraded, there's upgraded packages that allow them to have more storage, more uh, better, more advanced <coughs> templates. Um, and so far, over 200 people have signed up, 75% of which are, are still subscribed. Um, but, I mean, again, the, the, free, the free aspect of Portfolio Lounge, I think a lot of people are, are totally fine with. So no one has to upgrade, and I feel like it's gaining traction as we, as we wait on the original this.
Thank you, man, Jules. from Photosync. Oh, just a reminder, anyone in the back, when you um, speak for a question, let's see, hello, hello, I don't know if that's on anyway, um, I'll check into why these mics aren't amping, but just speak loudly so everyone can hear and we can pick it up on the mic. sensors, servers, and crop models to give corn and soy farmers uh, real-time intelligence. And real-time intelligence in the ag space means information about their operations, like where's their tractor, where's my worker, um, estimating yield, identifying uh, disease in fields, uh, improving market intelligence, ultimately with the goal of either lowering costs or increasing yields. And when people talk about precision ag, really they're at the base of that, they're talking about, um, they're talking about uh, real-time intelligence. So this is how they do it. Basically, they take, they run a whole bunch of field trials, uh, which cost them a bunch of money. They connect that with a bunch of proprietary data they're pulling from other sources, weather data or other types of information. They get a limited amount of data back from their user based on the user agreement. Uh, they pile that all together, and they provide a solution. So a classic sort of example of a precision ag or uh, real-time intelligence type solution is um, this is a field and a yield map. So a combine went over this field, identified the high high yield areas and low yield areas, they took that map, and the next year when they applied fertilizer, they applied more fertilizer in places with lower yield. That's good for the farm because he pays less money, but right? he's not putting fertilizer where he doesn't need it. Um, so that's fine, except it sucks. Uh, and it sucks because, one, the solutions are proprietary, uh, and as a result, it really inhibits collaboration, right? The feedback from the farmer back to the company isn't very good, and so the company's having to do all these research trials just to figure this stuff out, which ultimately is really expensive, and none of the companies talk to each other, so they're all having to duplicate a bunch of work. Um, as a result of the large amount of upfront cost, the service itself is expensive. So you have a lot of farmers who can't afford precision ag solutions, which is unfortunate. And then finally, for the same reason, because it's all very expensive, um, the only reason a company is going to enter a market if they have a billion dollars upfront cost just to set this thing up, then the market has to be really big. So you really only see precision ag solutions in the big markets in the US and Europe, like corn and soybeans. So who is going to provide, who's going to spend billions of dollars on serving minor crops or low profit um, uh, markets, which are potentially quite large, like $7.7 .7 billion for minor crops in the US, but they're very fragmented and they're very costly to enter. No one's going to do that. Uh, except for us, because we're, we're crazy. So Photosync is a, is a flexible platform to help any community, regardless of their size, uh, create their own real-time intelligence solution in agriculture. And this is how we do it. It's a little bit different. So uh, we're using open source tools to connect um, the entire community together, because we think that the knowledge and the skills um, to solve these precision ag type problems already exist within this community. It's just a question of bringing those folks together. So we've got scientists who know how to solve complex problems, educators who have an army of students capable of collecting data, and we have farmers and ag professionals with the context and the know-how to be able to refine and ultimately implement this solution. So our job, Photosync's job as a platform, is to really build the framework on which this community can be successful. All the way from identification of the problem, refining the solution, and then ultimately implementing it. So from the farmer's perspective, he pushes a button and he gets an answer. Right? He takes a measurement here and it says, yes, fertilize, no, don't fertilize. That should be the end product, even for ours. It should be that simple. So how does it work? Well, we have two different components of the platform. One is hardware. So uh, we have a variety of sensors, but our flagship um, device is a multi-spec. Um, we've shown this summer that we can do early identification of disease. Uh, we can do mid-season yield estimation, which is a big deal. Uh, it's low cost and it's all open source. Uh, those devices then connect to the software platform, either through an Android app on your phone or a Chrome app. Uh, the data gets pushed back to an online database where people can analyze those analysis tools. Uh, they can create projects, they can organize themselves uh, into groups uh, and ultimately ask and answer these difficult questions. 
And finally, there's developer tools so that once you have a solution, right, how do I identify disease X, you can implement that solution in a very simple way back to the farmer. So in other words, instead of selling a black box, right, we're giving people a toolkit to connect them with their colleagues all around the world so they can develop methods and, and solve big problems in their community. So you might be asking, like, well, why can't we just stick with depending on big ag right, to provide us with the productivity gains for the next 50 years, just like we have for the last 50 years. Well, the data doesn't show that that's what's happening. The data shows that in the next 50 years, there is a differential between what we're doing and, and where we need to be. We don't think that that differential is going to be solved in corn and soybeans because it's already, there's already been a lot of big ag in corn and soybeans. They've already made progress. We think that that differential is going to come from minor crops. Um, and the only way you're going to make that differential and improve productivity in minor crops is by empowering people and communities to make those improvements. Uh, so we've been doing this for a long time, let's get back. Uh, and <laughs> we've got a lot of data. Uh, and then we're looking for folks, uh, and we're going to be running a Kickstarter a month. And this is the data that's piled up over the course of our last two and a half years. All right. Thank you. Uh, Q&A, let's go. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so uh, I know that there's a, a company here in Ann Arbor, uh, Farm Logs, uh, that does some stuff around uh, data navigation. But you guys seem a little different because you both you have the sensors, you have a platform for uh, sharing information. So do you do you yourself as more like vertically integrated or potential competitor or collaborator with Farm Logs? Uh, no, we would be a collaborator with Farm Logs. Yeah, I mean, they're providing um, more like operational solutions for farmers um, and trying to simplify that operational experience. We're really creating um, a platform so that, so that instead of me going off into my university and doing research on half-acre plots, right, I can do research in real time with producers, right, and so I can learn and interact faster. The solutions that we come up with in the context of this platform might be implemented through somebody like Farmlands, ultimately. Yeah, I would spend some time. Right behind that. It looked like your sensor was doing some really fine-grained location. Is that something other than GPS? What we're using for placement? GPS. Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, so we would love, especially in greenhouse settings, to, to get higher accuracy GPS. There's actually a lot of value in that for, for plant breeders. It looked like grids of trays that you, you would want to just yeah. sample them. That would be awesome. Did you start with any specific um, Agriculture. I grew up on a cherry farm, and then you're talking about corn and soy. Oh, so cherry trees. Yeah. So, like, did you, but you, did you pick like one to start with, or are you looking really broad scale? So, like somebody else said, as a startup, we're still trying to figure out what the best market is. Um, and actually, we were just talking about this today. Um, we don't know from the tools that we have uh, which ag markets um, are going to produce the most interesting, um, most valuable solutions. Right, so that tool, whichever we're at, um, might produce really interesting <laughs> solutions for areas, right? And we'll talk about some of that. It might, it might have nothing to say for, for corn. We can't really know that until we try sort of a wide swath of things. That's kind of where we're at right now. I've done a little bit of uh, research on uh, the sensors that you can build to help uh, inform you about some type help using like uh, infrared light and absorption spectra. Are you designing your own hardware to like detect light health, or are you using stuff off the shelf? No, 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 this is all. In fact, I mean, our team's biggest strength is really in the hardware and analog design. So we came out of a lab, which is a photosynthesis lab, which has been designing hardware for photosynthesis for 20 years in lab. So we took a ten or twenty thousand dollar benchtop piece of equipment and made it into this little device. It's like, if, if you're not already planning to, then I humbly suggest that uh, one of the Kickstarter like low level rewards be like a, a kit or like a like yes. that'd be really cool. This is actually one of the big questions for us is we know that there's interest in the research community. We don't really fully understand the interest or willingness in the in the home community. Question no. So um, obviously it sounds like this came out of the research side. Do you have a, a monetization plan or is that not going community platforms are great, but what what's the ultimate yeah, um, well, you know, we do have a focus on um, open software, hardware, and data, um, and we've tried to build our, our, our monetization plans around those constraints, which has been difficult, but I think mm -hmm. possible. 
Um, so what we're trying to do is build a community in which we're going to encourage transactions at some point, right? So person A may want to pay person B to collect data on the platform, right? I'll pay you 15 cents for every measurement you take as part of my project, right? And then we would take a, a cut of that transaction, for example. Or we can pay for um, private data storage in the same way that GitHub does. Uh, you know, there's models in that in that context that we can generate. And then we can keep everything as open as possible, because we want as many people on the platform as possible, and we close, start to close things off, and it looks like nothing's there. How much did your center cost? Uh, it costs about 200 bucks to make. How much? $200 to make. Like time for about one more question. Oh, there's one back here that I might have missed. What, how, how else did you get into this, personally? Like, what, what uh, was it just uh, working in academics that turned you onto it, or? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an open technology advocate. Mm -hmm. So I went and met somebody who's, who's, a, uh, who's a photosynthesis guy, uh, and then we sort of connected ideas, and that was two and a half years ago. So cool. we've had a lot of partners. So, yeah. Great presentation. Next up, we got uh, Tim and Eric from Eloquence Communications. classic button, you click it and the buzzer rings, the nurse gets a page, they run into your room and they say, hey, what do you need? And then they have to run out, get what you need, and come back. That's kind of slow. So you've got one-way communication, they don't have any idea, and if they don't speak the right language, then they have to go find the interpreter, and we've talked to people, they say they never know where the interpreter phone is, or they don't have that language available. So nobody knows basically what they're what they need. So what our solution provides is we've improved this. We have two-way communication with VoIP integrated. So the nurses will carry around phones. They can call back to the patient. They can call other nurses. We have call prioritization. So a call for someone's in pain is going to get priority over someone needs a glass of water. We've got it in 11 languages currently. And we're looking at adding more. So, someone may not speak English, they only speak German. You can push the button in German, it's still going to come through on the nurse's phone in English. And we've got advanced reports, which will show what kind of calls are being used, which floors need more staff, which floors have too much staff, things like that. So you can optimize your staffing. We're going to give a quick demo. All right. In the center here, we have the patient's device. This will be an Android tablet. Uh, we're working with hardware vendors for that. There's already vendors going in, putting in basically TVs or um, swing arms, so you have the internet and all that, and you can check your email and whatnot. So we're having to partner with them. We're a software company, so we're not going to handle that. On the left side, you have the AIDS phone or TAC, whatever you want to call them. On the right side, you got the nurse. Currently, we have it in English. We'll leave it like that for now, since we all understand it. This is an emulator, so it's a little slower than it would be with the actual patient. Yeah, you can't barely hear it here, but you have audio feedback to reach basically what's on the screen. So the nurse sees that the patient's in pain. She can hit go to call. The patient's going to get some feedback, unlike you do with your traditional nurse call system, which you have no idea what's happening until somebody actually shows up at your room to ask what your issue is, and then they go figure out who they need to get. So if you're in pain, typically the nurse tech will come in, and then she can't give you pain meds. So she has to leave, go get the nurse, come back with the pain meds. Really, when you're in pain, that's not what you want to happen. Uh, for 
another example, I'm actually going to switch it to another language. Let's go with Hindi. I think that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I can't read these. I have no idea. <laughs> got feedback here call was sent. The AHC is that this patient needs a drink. We're working on, we have framework underneath all this for food ordering. <coughs> There's an additional button that appears when it's not in English. This one right here. It's, it's requesting an interpreter. We're in talks with a couple different <coughs> translation agencies right now to have that go directly to their agency where you pop up. Now you're in a video conference with <coughs> an interpreter. So we've got hardware vendors, we're talking with the company in Germany and the company in Ohio. Uh, we're just working out legal agreements on that. The language, we're just starting the talks to hopefully get a live interpreter on the screen. So we're going to reduce your need for interpreters, increase patient satisfaction, reduce your fall rating. And with fall rating, I mean that as uh, walk to the bathroom, or if you're in pain, you can wait just that little much longer, knowing that somebody's on the way and they've heard your request. There's escalations. This call is green right now. You can set different thresholds. It'll go yellow, it'll go red. It'll escalate if this person doesn't take care of it in time, it'll go to the nurse. The nurse doesn't take care of it and you have phones for your charge nurse, it'll go to the charge nurse. Uh, it'll also balance the amount of workload you have. So one nurse or one aide isn't doing all the work for the whole facility. That's about it. Uh, we are hiring. tablet in front of the patient. Uh, if you just have a handheld tablet, uh, hospitals are really worried about theft. Somebody's going to walk off with that tablet. And in all, basically all good hospitals that you're in right now, you're going to have a tablet in front of you or you're going to have an interactive TV. Uh, so they're going for infotainment. Not nurse call, not patient caregiver communication. So we can write on top of that platform, add a lot more value to their service. Ideally we want to replace a nurse call system completely. So that pillow book they call it a pillow speaker, a button, you press the red button. We want to replace that. But we have to work with these hardware vendors to do that. Yes. Have you stumbled across any regulations? Oh, yeah. This arena? Yes. <laughs> Quite definitely. Okay. From FDA. 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 Well, UL is a, a certification. FDA, if you just want to be legal, but you really need UL certification to go into a facility. They're not going to yeah, buy it. It's underwriter's lab? Yeah. Yes. You all 1069 okay, I, and I understand that. Yeah. I'm more questioning the liability of this versus your mechanical systems that exist today. Well, I mean, they're Are they going to make you go through like tests, verifications, certifications? Yes. Our company was started with an NIH grant with University of Michigan Health System, so they got half of the money basically for doing the research that led into this, designing the UI. Uh, user studies with patients, with nurses to design the whole system front to back. So we didn't really come up with this. We listened to their input and created what they needed. You're bringing it to market. Yep. Yes. I, oh, I, I think to clarify maybe this question is in, in automotive, for instance, there's a standard called ISO 26262, which has your analyses of, of what a failure would be and then how you have to respond and then redundancies if there is a Right. Yeah. yeah. I, guess, I think that's what his question is. What happens have, if your system breaks down? We have that in uh, UL 1069. Yeah, FDA isn't really robust in this instance. So hospitals don't rely on the FDA to say, oh, you're approved, good, and we'll, have, we'll get you in our system, right? So they look at <laughs> UL certification. And UL requires like making a million calls on it. All these different things. Interference. So we're going with possibly Wi Fi. And the actual Wi-Fi standard, 802.11, unlike everyone else who's gone into wireless in this realm, does proprietary. Um, so you have to worry about clashing signals and stuff like that. There's a lot of tasks they're doing. Are you running into, into, into any uh, activity-based costing uh, systems, EHR systems, uh, or 
We'd love to. That's not what our money was funded for. Uh, but once customers start saying they need that, then yes, we're going to customize. We're not going to do it for every facility or potential customer. If that's what it takes to sign the contract, yes, we're going to integrate. That's not a problem. Is this on a tablet or a smartphone? Tablet for the patient, smartphones for the nurses. Well, well, yeah, well, the question then is, um, you know, there's the existing remote with the buttons, yep. and there's the glass-based interface with these. You know, have you guys thought about, like, in terms of, uh, I don't know, the, the germs or bacteria on each of these surfaces and how one would be different in terms of sanitary? Sure, yeah, the equipment manufacturers that we're talking with, they use antimicrobial plastic, and you can clean it down. They're all aware of what it takes to be in the healthcare industry. But would that be a value-add versus the regular remote? Or? Uh, no, I think they're all cleanable. So what's your time frame of, of being able to have beta in a hospital? We've already had betas at long-term care facilities. And to the hospital. Yeah, hospital. That uh, we have evaluation kits out at UC San Diego, Cleveland Clinic, and I want to say there's one more and I forget the name. I don't remember where it went. But yeah, Cleveland Clinic's really or not Cleveland Clinic. UC San Diego's really interested. They've got four evaluation kits currently. Uh, they're looking at it not for every room but you have a tablet that you deploy that's sitting at the nurse station when you have a patient that's innovative or doesn't speak English, they bring it up that time, and it's mobile. Does the system have a built-in um, way of recording the alien with kind of a use of high priority? Um, if you try to request, make a call, yeah. Like if you want a glass of water and you say you're in pain, this will be a pump faster. Sure. Um, I mean, I know it's always a yeah. problem, but like kind of like. Yeah, there's really not much we can do on that. We, we can stop you from hitting the button over and over and over. It'll just say the call's already been sent, right. and it won't send an additional call. Right. And the facility can decide, hey, if they hit the same button in two minutes, don't send another call, ah. or 30 seconds, or whatever they want. Right. But yeah, if you some behavior like that, they might just take it away from you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> one more, we'll do one more question. What kind of security do you have to put in there so somebody can't spoof your system? Sure, yeah, everything's encrypted end to end. Yeah, we, we use um, public key encryption. The server has to sign all of its packets, so uh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Beyond that, it looks at the MAC addresses and everything in the system, make sure you're really a room you're associated with. So. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Very much. All right. Our final presenter for this evening is Mike from Maker OS. Coming in from Detroit to visit us here tonight. Tonight, uh, my name is Mike Mosheri from Maker OS. Uh, we're a software startup based in Midtown Detroit, and we have created Maker OS, the operating system for your maker business. Now, what the hell is a maker business? I say that word, and most people have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. A maker business is a 3D printing service providing company or a small manufacturing company. Uh, one of our example companies uh, that we like to use, and one of our customers, is ThinkSmiths. ThinkSmiths is right up on State Street. They do 3D printing and design and 3D scanning services for people at the university, research centers, and for small startups and uh, other enterprises. And one of the problems that uh, Owen Teen, the CEO of uh, ThinkSmiths, was telling me that he was having was all the issues of having these late orders. You get all these orders from email, and email is the bane of everybody's existence these days. Everybody's trying to eliminate it. So what happens is somebody e emails you a file, you get a a quote, try to get a quote out to them. You're using QuickBooks, then you're using your ERP system, then you're using a 3D file analyzer, and you're using all these spreadsheets. And it's a very convoluted and very expensive process. So we took an approach to kind of treat it holistically um, in looking at different maker businesses and create a very easy process to go from submitting an order to getting a quote, getting paid, and actually running the production itself. So Maker OS allows you to pull quotes on three-dimensional parts for production instantly, and also is at zero cost to you, and you can do about an in, about infinite uh, amount of these uh, transactions. 
So what we like to say is that when you utilize MakerOS, you're speeding up your business process by 5x. So when a process that typically takes about a week or so can now take a day or two. And then when we're talking about the cost onto you, you're looking at, you know, you know, we say that software gets rid of jobs, but you know, we're basically enhancing the process, right? <laughs> so you don't need that sales engineer sitting there manually doing all these quotes and logging in your ERP. That's all happening automated and automatically. We as we say automatically, and then the project manager as well. So you're having a lot of human costs going into this number here, the 180, and then it brings down all that consolidation into one single application. So our solution again is a web platform that integrates within any website. It's all hosted onto our servers. It works on mobile, desktop, and we even tested it on Teslas. So it works on the car itself. And to kind of show you just a little bit of a demo of it, what I have here is uh, you know, this is the dashboard. It can be white labeled onto any company. So I made it a test project with our cool Batmobile right here. So when a customer creates a project, they're uh, instantly brought to a uh, an activity feed, and then I have my friend Joe over there uh, who's going to send me a little message, and we get real-time updates and integrations with chat applications like Slack, HipChat, uh, and, and uh, Stripe. So once he sends that message, we'll get a little notification on there. Uh, we have our own uh, cloud file hosting system as well, so you can upload from any uh, cloud hosting provider that you use, Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, etc. You can take selfies with your phone. You can upload it. So it's really uh, fun and snappy. It works on you know, any scaling that you're using in a screen resolution. But again, the biggest factor here is doing this automatic quoting. So when you submit a file, you want to get a quote as an end customer. You submit that file, you hit quote, and then you go and choose your materials. Okay, I want this in ABS, and I model this thing in millimeters, and I want one of them, but I also want a post-processing uh, finish on this. And all these parameters are set by the service provider themselves and using our back-end algorithm in order to produce the actual price itself. So when I hit this and go into our billing, um, depending on if the file is processed or not, it'll produce a quote. So we, I did one earlier, and I could submit this order, and then they can purchase it within an invoice. And then with the in invoice, um, you can actually have that payment gateway directly linked up to your bank account as the service provider. So with all these different systems in place, uh, we have to be really connected with certain things. So when I look at, uh, let's see, what happens when you get paid? Oh, come on, come on, come on. I saw, I saw a gift. That's RoboCop. <laughs> anyways, there's a really awesome gift that plays, and we have a repository, and it kind of brings up team morale, and it shows gifts of people throwing money, and it helps everybody kind of bring everything together. So, the, again, a lot of the features that we have are chat, 3D viewer, uh, across any 3D files, uh, STLs, 3MF, uh, IGES files, auto coding system. But again, you bring all these features together, it brings your business alive. It becomes some sort of organism that you're able to pull in different resources and react much quicker and really enhance the whole process of your business. So within uh, one year, we've had about 1,400 signups now, Joe, right? 1,400 signups. Uh, we have our beta product out there. We've been featured in about 20 stories now. Um, and then we have about 500,000 that we've raised uh, since day one. And our business model, for a quick last two seconds, um, we have a, a credit card processing fee onto each transaction that a provider makes with their customers. But we also have a $400 a month tier, which eliminates that 3% uh, on top of the credit card processing, uh, which is an annual rate of about $4,800 to larger enterprises, netting in over uh, 10 grand a month. So that is us. We're also looking for team members. Um, if you know anybody that wants a job in these fields, uh, we have a bouncy on their heads for three hundred and thirteen dollars, and I might throw in some extra couple dollars in there if you get to them fast. <laughs> Great, thanks, Mike. Some questions from Mike. Are there other tools that people are using for uh, makeovers besides the view pictures, puzzle covers, shop boxes? Yeah, so uh, one of our primary beta testers back in the summer that signed up is a $20 million a year business, and they do um, aerospace jobs for Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and they're a huge uh, CNC operation. So they do mid to high volume production for those types, but they're opening up a 3D printing operation, but they also see value in adding this process to their uh, rapid manufacturing department. In the back. How old is that? They're probing. How does it actually work, and how robust is it? 
Um, that's uh, proprietary, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, essentially what happens is that the system takes a look at all the metrics of the 3D file itself, and then we have an algorithm on the back end and different parameters set by the service provider. So if you have one metric about the file and another pricing method of the service provider, you match those together, do some math, and then you get the price. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. So you can edit your your type of process, any type of three D printing process, CNC machining, laser cutting. Uh, you can quote by many different metrics, whether it's um, by cubic volume of a part, surface area, by time. And it all kind of works together in any of these processes, colors, finishes, etc. So it seems like one of the sales challenges you might have is um, if you have an existing business that's kind of been doing this ad hoc knowing that the quotes that go out match like what you've basically been charging? You, have you experienced that? And if so, how do you deal with it? Um, so that really hasn't been a challenge for us to kind of adapt these businesses to a process like this. It's usually, you know, a story by the numbers. You know, I, I tell them, this is what you're spending on your salesperson, this is what you're going to spend on our system, and you can tweak it as much as you want until you get it right to where you need it to be. Give me a profile of a typical customer? So a typical customer of, uh, let's say, a business doing over $250,000 a year, uh, three, four uh, full-time employees, they have about uh, five to six 3D printers, um, and they do service customers from the consumer electronics uh, industry and uh, small entrepreneurs. So that basic profile would be things missed right there on State Street. That's kind of like our basic. So they're, they're the 15,000 customers you currently have? Yeah, they're either one of them, yeah. What's, what's the origin of your, like, everyone involved with the company? Do you come from the 3D printing side or? So my team's right here. Everybody stand up. These guys, okay. These guys are the future, man. Like, <laughs> I have a son. <laughs> So, I mean, we have, you know, Zach, who is, uh, Zach, we have multiple Zachs, Zach Wick, uh, who's done a lot of IoT type of development. Uh, we have Zach Kismarson, that's worked on quite a lot of CRM systems at Barracuda. We have Joe Tavares, who's our database security guy, a big data dude, big picture. And then we have our new sales guy, Steve Rizzo, right there, uh, coming in from Chicago. So, we're able to uh, steal talent away from bigger cities, I like to say. So... Uh, again, if you like ping pong and cool teams and awesome projects and being in Detroit, we're kind of your team. And don't let, don't let Mike fool you, we're not all that confused. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where did you guys all, how did you all connect? Um, through networking. Uh, the biggest thing that I would recommend any startup to do is go to groups like these. Uh, start looking at hacker maker spaces. Uh, go on Angel's List, go through basically every avenue you can online. Um, and you gotta have an awesome product, you gotta have an awesome vision, uh, and most importantly, you gotta be able to pull all that together in a timely manner. Execution. And I guess my parable of the day would be ex uh, an idea without execution is hallucination. So. One final question if anyone's got one. Otherwise, can't think of a better way to wrap. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, community announcement time. If anybody has anything they want to announce, if you wouldn't mind coming down around front, it's nice to like line up around the side and make your announcement up here so everybody can hear you well. Just take a minute to line up. Well, there's well, you're up there, okay? You, you, you put the teaser up. Oh, the teaser. Yeah, where's the... What, what, what is? What's the, 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 the individual who brought this guy in. Raise your hand. Somebody here. This is yeah. Gadget. That's you, right? Yeah. I'll tell you, yeah, kick us off and tell us what this... Or tell us what you're looking for and what's your community announcement related to the prop that you so cleverly placed in the, the way for a matching shirt. Stand by the prop. 
No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm looking for Android developers or backend uh, server people. Uh, I also in, in, uh, inherited a virtual reality meetup, and that's meeting next Monday at Tech Town. If anyone's interested in uh, learning about virtual reality, you, you, well, you ain't come with that, yeah. So I asked him about the drone. <laughs> yeah. What was the question? What does it do? Uh, this is. As far as I can see, the first virtual reality drone has uh, six cameras around the perimeter so that the airframe is never in the view. And you use it with uh, Google Cardboard or Gear VR. And you can just look around without needing uh, any skills with control. Cool. Okay, I'm, I'm not pitching virtual reality or uh, Google Cardboard or anything like that. I'm here for the fifth annual search marketing workshop. And our theme this year is the fusion of everything. And I look around the room and I see some of our speakers who are going to be here uh, speaking in our startup panel focused on high tech um, at noon, uh, how to get maximum digital impact from minimum budget. Um, our theme is uh, uh, going to start off with a uh, big data presentation by the Director of Digital, uh, Digital Advertising and Analytics for GM, controls hundreds of millions of dollars in spend. One of the few people in the country really positioned to talk about this subject from a position of knowledge, uh, from somebody who's on client side actually trying to consume this data. Then we've got a track going on integrated digital marketing, focusing on social and search, and then another one focusing on digital and multiple screens, and then we've got some uh, pure strategy tracks. 35 bucks with code early at thesearchmarketingworkshop.com. I have plenty of flyers. If you can't remember that, I'll be here. Happy to hand them out. And you get about $35 worth of food. Too. That's right, you do. Delicious <laughs> breakfast and lunch. Hey everyone, we're students here at the law school uh, representing two of the clinics here. Uh, we offer high quality and free legal services to tech companies uh, in the area and other organizations. Uh, we operate like a law firm. We're working under experienced clinical professors and we work with law firms across the country on both coasts. So, uh, we're, I'm with the Transactional Lab. We pretty much do everything after you form and after you start up, you know, things like your operating agreements, agreements, your licenses, you know, pretty much when you're going to sell to a customer, you come to us. Then there's the uh, entrepreneurship clinic. Yeah, I'm part of the entrepreneurship clinic. Uh, our customer base is mostly you guys, or clientele, I should say. Uh, we handle most of the entity formation, uh, intellectual property matters, employment agreements, uh, financing, if you need your handheld through that. Uh, and so that's, that's our bread and butter. So if you have any of those issues, you know, talk to us. And if you're having any legal issues, you can come talk to us and there's someone here at the law school who can help you out. There's a lot of different clinics, you know, there's a place for you guys to come and we can help you out with that. How do we reach you? Yeah. Yeah. Do we we'll, we'll be, here. We'll, we'll be right, right over here hanging out. out. After after us. Today. Yeah, yeah, right. That's it. No. Um, the, the Michigan Law School website provides a lot of information and we'll be here uh, to hopefully talk to everyone who wants to talk to us right now. And our services are free. Yeah. If you didn't hear that. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. A2 Geek supports this meetup. It also supports Ann Arbor Ignite. The 10th Ignite Ann Arbor is Friday the 13th of November, 7 o'clock, in the formerly Blau, now Robertson Auditorium in the Ross School of Business over there. Ignite is a five-minute piece of PowerPoint performance art. 20 slides that advance every 15 seconds while you talk about things that aren't necessarily tech startups. But there are other things in the world to talk about than tech startups. The companies have, the companies, the presenters have been selected. The program will get published this week. Put it on your calendar for Friday the 13th, 7 o'clock, and the same uh, after party at the Pizza House. Pizza House. Yes. <laughs> so different meetups, same after party. <laughs> I'm the CEO of a company called Alchemy. We create games for higher education starting with organic chemistry. I launched this company uh, 
year and a half ago, and we're going to swing for the fences starting January 1 with an NSF grant. We have a partner in Boston that gives us distribution channels, and we're looking for graphic designers and um, uh, developers in C Sharp or Unity 3D, and we are going to change the way kids learn higher education, starting with organic chemistry. So see me, Julia Winter Alchemy is the name of my company. Hello, I'm Paul Sihan. I have a couple of jobs that I'd like to announce here. The company I work with, the Escapes Network, is a television broadcast network. Uh, we also do digital signage for hospitals, Promedica, or Broma, Broma, um, Michigan Dental Association, and other companies. We're looking for a, a video ed editor. It's paid um, paid inter internship full time, and the company is actually located in Monroe, Michigan. I work out, a lot out of my house here, but um, so it'd be uh, Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, After Effects, uh, Microsoft Office, Excel, or PowerPoint. If anybody is interested, uh, you know. And then there's another position that has to do more with uh, big data, and it's a startup company that works with. Um, Unfortunately, I can't. Gosh, it isn't. Let me get out of this tablet mode. And uh, that uh, has to do with JavaScript. Uh, someone with like five years of JavaScript and can work with ElkStack, Elasticsearch, Log Logstash, Kibana, um, MongoDB. So it's a big data and programming uh, position for startup that works with uh, Aruba network um, gear and. Um, Big data stuff. So, sorry, I wasn't wasn't totally clear, but there's a you know it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty involved description. If anybody's interested, uh, please uh, Paul C. Hunt, just come and say hi. By the way, if anybody uh, presents here any, any any announcements, put it on the meetup site so that uh, you can't write it fast enough for everybody here. So, hello, I'm Joe Donahue, and. Uh, Started a company four years ago, an automotive software company up in Brighton. When I did, my hair was jet black, but we're doing great today. We're global, we're mobile, and uh, we're really uh, looking to bring on some additional talent to help us uh, grow this great automotive service business. So, Joe's my name. I'm back here. We're up in Brighton. Come and talk to me. Thank you. My name is Dan, CXO of Petricor. We're a software technology startup down in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, we're building a container platform as a service based around the easy deployment and scaling of containers. Uh, we're looking for talent. Uh, we're looking for back-end programmers, people with server level and networking level understanding of programming. Uh, we're looking for front-end developers. We're looking for QA people. Uh, and, and we're solving a lot of interesting problems. We're, we're in uh, late-stage development. We're incorporating, we're funded, and we have an options pool, and we're extremely motivated to find somebody. So you can talk to uh, the two uh, folks over here in Blue Plaid, Jake and Alex, these are my coworkers. Uh, we're, we're excited to talk to you. So let us know. Thanks. Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Jason. A few years back, I founded a local venture capital firm here in town, and since then have invested in some of Ann Arbor's most prominent security startups, like Duo Security, Deep Field Networks, and Verta Labs. And uh, it's obviously our intent that we think this is a great town for security startups, um, but I'm interested in your opinion. So if you happen to have an interesting take on why you think this is a great town to have a security startup, I'd like to talk with you afterwards. Again, my name's Jason. Thank you. I'm Krista, and I'm the founder of Entreslam, which is a business storytelling competition that's held here in Ann Arbor. And Mike, I was just at your your uh, stomping grounds at Tech Town for Biz Grid Live, so we just messed up your desk while we were there. <laughs> so at any rate, um, so we have an event coming up this Thursday, which is the third round of Entreslam. And what's really cool about what we're doing is we're helping folks like you guys, you know, bring tech and narrative together in order to create a compelling connection because we're not all about data and numbers, right? It's about how do we really connect with folks, and sometimes it's really difficult to do it if there isn't a story. So we pull that out and, um, and we rock it, you know, um, three times a year. Um, our finale is gonna be at the ARC, which will be December 14th, and the top storyteller wins $10,000.
Just a little bit of chump change. But um, yeah, come on out Thursday to Bar Louie, 7 to 9, and Entre Slam uh, Business Storytelling Competition. I'm Krista, and thank you for letting me play today. Good job. <laughs> Kelsey Treview and I'm a product designer at a company called Farm Logs, which we were talking about earlier. Um, and we're actually looking for another product designer, and it's kind of funny, I actually got the job through ATU Tech, sort of, kind of. So if you're out there and you're a designer and you're looking to, you know, do something new, talk to me. Um, you can also go to farmlogs.com slash jobs and see more information out there. There's other jobs that we have posted as well. Also, we have um, a design group that Farmlog started. It's called a2design.org. And you can, it's, very, it's a very basic website. You can just sign up and put your email in there, and you'll get notified when we do a meetup. Um, and we're going to probably do one within the next month or so. So keep checking your inbox. And yeah, I'm Kelsey. Thanks. <laughs> Hey everyone, uh, Steve Sherman. We started another meetup group called Ann Arbor Lean Startup Circle. So if you like A2 New Tech, which I love, uh, but want to take it a little more hands-on and be held accountable uh, beyond the pitch deck, that's kind of our goal. Um, we've had three meetups so far. We cover things like customer discovery, business model canvas, solution experiments and MVPs, and really just want to put some accountability to building traction in the community. Um, our next meetup is November 12th. Um, and if you search Ann Arbor Lean Startup Circle, um, the meetup page is our main communication channel. And I'll be here to talk about it too. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for all the community announcements. Um, I got to put my plug in. So my day job is running product and marketing at a company in town called Nutshell. And uh, we're trying to build a CRM that salespeople love. Um, been around for a number of years, a couple thousand customers, and uh, we are on that engineering hiring binge right now. So iOS, Android, and PHP backend. Uh, the the offer I have, even if you're not somebody in this room who might want the job, if you can refer anyone to us, uh, our CEO or CTO will take you out to lunch. Um, and uh, oh, refer a qualified candidate. They're gonna. They're gonna be good. <laughs> So somebody that we said is like, yep, we, we think they're eligible for this job, uh, they'll take you out to lunch and you can pick their brain about what it was like getting the company started, getting funded, all that good stuff. Um, so thanks again to all of our speakers tonight. You guys did really great. And uh, we're going to be moseying over to Pizza House. Uh, there's like a large room in there where people can grab food and beer and hang out for a bit. So mingle around here, uh, meet your neighbor, and uh, see you later on this evening. Thanks for coming out.